The Tuning Fork, setting the tone for cultural activism through weekly encounters with cultural activists worldwide, live on ICAI, Institute for Cultural Activism International. Okay, we're live, and this is our 19th show, which is quite Wonderful. Quite an achievement, if we not so humbly saying so ourselves. But thanks to all of you, uh, you're sort of making our dream come true. Emily and I, Emily Harris, who's just right here next to me in the same room. Um, we yeah. had the concept in mind a little after, you know, the pandemic started last year. And we tried to create a kind of a, a holding space or a placeholder with the idea of a tuning fork, you know, that the tuning fork holds a certain, a certain vibration, a certain tone. Um, so the idea is that we, we sort of, you know, resonate together in this space as, as cultural activists. And I dare say that people who attend and most certainly our guests are not complacent people. They're very proactive people. And it's very, uh, it's a great privilege for, for Emily and I to, to be part of this every week. And thank you, Nancy Azara, for, for joining us. It's um, really significant that you're here with us, Nancy. Um, thank you. And thank Darla and Emily also for helping to set up your uh, technical support there in the studio down mm -hmm. in Tribeca. Yes, it was um, wonderful. They were very, it was really great they helped, that they yeah. helped. Uh, so basically the format, um, I think many people who've been here know how we usually run our show. Um, mm -hmm. It's a 90 minute show. The first 60 minutes are pretty much restrained to conversation between Nancy and I, and I've got to try to keep pace with her. Um, and then for 30 minutes afterwards, we, we all can, can share uh, comments and questions and conversations. Um, is, is Margaret here from, from uh, Amsterdam? I'm not sure. There's yeah. so many people here I can't see. Oh, hey, Margaret. There you go. <laughs> nice yeah. to be here for the first time. It's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, and Margaret will be one of our guests in the nearest future. Uh, Gordon Skinner's here. He was our guest last week. Um, our friend Ron Smith is always here. And that's <laughs> one of the pillars of uh of our program ron thank you so and and, and there's also uh, ron daniels out in mackinac northern uh michigan upper michigan upper peninsula the up guys not ups but <laughs> great you see you uberland we call it uberland uberland yeah uper uberland oh, uberland yeah uberland <laughs> Have you ever been out there, Nancy? Um, I've been to Minnesota several times. <laughs> I taught, used to teach in Minnesota, and there were people from that area who would take my classes sometimes. So it would be well, kind of fun. Ron's Ron's uncle is uh, is is um, Barking Dog Sundance Chief uh, Daryl Brown, and mm -hmm. he was on our show back in October. Mm -hmm. And we'll be attending a Sundance ceremony in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, sometime is it June or July? So I, I think um, everyone here is probably invited, right, Ron? Yes, July six, July sixteenth is Tree Day. It's a Wednesday, so you want to be there the, like the Sunday before. Spend a week with us. It's a beautiful time. Thanks, Ron. You're welcome. Um, Nancy, I just want to start off with a few. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, kind of. Um, relevant questions, I think, to our times right now. And mm -hmm. I just begin to notice, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've noticed a few people, even in my family, who seem to express a kind of um, a defiant kind of sense of freedom now that this uh, vaccine seems to be, you know, uh, becoming more accessible and fluid, literally, mm -hmm. in, in our society. And I'm wondering, um, you know, in the last year, we've seen so much movement toward looking inward, looking at our lives, looking at our priorities and our, our deep, deep values. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, um, you know, like 
family, um, purpose in life, priorities, yeah? Um, and at the same time, we're seeing a kind of a, what's happened, of course, in our, in our civil unrest uh, and for so many other reasons due to COVID and other conditions, there's a kind of a, see, a tendency toward the clan-like behavior, maybe even cult-like behavior, maybe even, you know, this, what we call pods and um, safe spaces with people. But um, I wonder what you think this kind of freedom that we're seeing uh, that kind of it travels with the vaccine. Will we see, you know, this kind of um, what I'm calling a kind of vengeful or defiant arrogance, but born of all the frustration that some people have had? And you know, um, have you thought about uh, these kind of things in, in your work and 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 in your reflections? Um, some people maybe just don't have the opportunity to look inward during this time. Um, and to benefit maybe from introspection. Um, of course, cultural activists almost uh, need to by, by design of the uh, analytic mind, mm -hmm. um, the mind that you know, deconstructs issues, social problems and crises and tries to present new visions for society as you've done mm -hmm. in your past. What, what are your observations, Nancy? What are your concerns as we sort of go ahead into the next uh, near future? Uh, well, I think the clan idea has a lot of merit. People are connecting more to themselves and the people are the friends that have been around them in new ways, I think. I think the downside is uh, that uh, it's too exclusionary. It doesn't, allow, it doesn't open up to the, all this excitement that's in the world which of course I, I know most of us or many of us don't feel right now uh, because of the, well, the political situation in the United States and the kind of cultist attitude that we're, we read about every day, uh, I think is very damaging to, um, to really explore the essence of who we are. And artists, that's sort of what artists do I mean, some artists, many artists, and the genuine nature of making art and being creative is exploring what's within yourself. So I think that by and large, uh, people have, on the one hand, felt despair all through this. And on the other hand, there's a kind of excitement about uh, the vaccine and cha the change that's coming. Um, and we hope that the vaccine does present a, a real large, broad um, appreciation within us and gives us uh, the safety that we've been hoping it will give. I mean, for now, it looks like it will. Um, I don't know if the newspapers are exaggerating because it does help, or the news does help to sell uh, things, but I don't, so I don't know um, about that in relationship to the, what really is the danger with these new viruses that are, the new um, parts of the virus that are now coming into our lives. So I'm hoping that, um, I'm hoping for the best with all of that, but I know that it's really hard and I know that Hyperallergic Magazine, which is an online magazine, did an article, uh, or many, several, invited artists to talk about their experience uh, during the pandemic and to show their studios and how their work had changed or not changed. And many did, and I think that's worth looking into. Uh, it's not hard to get. I mean, you can just go online and look it up, but it's quite... Yeah. Uh, Emily can tap mm -hmm. in maybe a couple of links. We did have um, a hyperallergic interview that we posted in our flyer with your announcement. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, so in your own sort of process, Nancy, does yeah. your tactile work, mm -hmm. you know, with materials, does right. that somehow, um, somehow anchor you or ground you in, in the material world in a way that is... Uh, sort of contemplative in some way that, you know, um, you can 
operate in a certain state without panic? Well, I think panic is, is one part of life that we have to all learn to live with in some way. And so, uh, however we define that for ourselves and however we manage to live with panic, especially at a time like this. When, but when I think about the generations before us, for instance, what my parents went through, uh, uh, they went through um, World War I, they went through the first pan that big pandemic of 1918. They never discussed that. And basically until recently, we never, we, I never read about it. I know it killed more people than World War I killed. Um, it was so such an awful thing. And uh, I just been, I've been reading a bit about it and it's not unparalleled to some of the things we're experiencing now. Uh, the way pe people's attitudes towards it, uh, people's panic. I mean, that's a good word to use about it. <clears throat> and then there was World War II. So there was so much in the Depression. So there was so much that the generations before us had to deal with. I mean, we had the Vietnam, the tragedy of the Vietnam War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. Um, the excitement of the civil rights movement and the excitement of the women's movement. Okay, yeah, let's let's go into that. All right. Um, that women's right, the women's movement, um, mm -hmm. you know, you, you were part of this as a very um, sort of vital catalyst of the women's movement. Yeah. Um, when you were working, you, you must have had a lot of conflict as as a as a female artist, as a woman artist. Um, what, what was it that actually sort of evoked your sort of initiative? Your your um, seemed like choiceless path to uh, activism. What do you feel like activated that? Which part? I mean, that's a big, huge um, kind of um, umbrella there. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could start with the fact that most women in the 1950s <clears throat> and most women who were older in the 1950s had already been forced back into their homes and told that because, even though they helped uh, win World War II and uh, the government was grateful, it was very dangerous to allow uh, their children not to have a mother. So my mother and many of her friends, and I don't know enough about her friends, but my mother was very unhappy person because she really did want to participate in society in some way. But as an Italian American woman, woman from um, whose parents were born in Europe, uh, she really um, had no permission to become a different person. Although she did love the movies, which showed very um, independent women. She loved Jane Russell and she loved um, Lana Turner. And she loved, she loved uh, man tailored suits. She would always talk about them. And um, I know my daughter watches a lot of those movies. So on occasion, I can see their, um, you know, their merit. I mean, they were usually striped and they were very male-like and they had short skirts and um, very, I have some suits too with those wonderful shoulders, very broad shoulders. Yeah. And so um, that was something that um, was very exciting to her and bewildered me as a child because I could never figure out why. You know, why um, <clears throat> people just couldn't be what they wanted to be. So when the women's came along, women's movement came along, for most of us, this was a great fit. It's exactly what we had been looking for. We were able to uh, find each other. And my experience, although I was involved in Red Stockings, um, uh, which was a broader movement uh, women involved in broader things uh, than art, just art, 
I was extremely connected to women in women's art movement. And I had a consciousness raising group. And I wonder sometimes every time I mention consciousness raising, how many people know what that was now. Right. It'd be good to look it up because it was a wonderful tool that we used. Nancy, because, how did the, 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 uh, the men, the yeah. gentlemen artists, how did they respond to the idea of women having some power in the cultural world? Except for very few, not well. Um, and they had, you know, they had to learn. There were a couple of men's groups that started. And um, I heard they were very confrontational. Wait, you mean, you mean to say a men's group started in and some response women's to groups. women groups? Is that well, they, did, they did because they were bewildered. And often we'd have these women's meetings and they would tell their husbands or boyfriends they couldn't be there. They would we'd come and they'd look pathetic as they left. I mean, it was <laughs> it was a scenario that people um, participated in, and uh, we we of course at that point we didn't care. We would just Elka, you're here, are you? I'm here. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. And if you have anything else, Elki, that you would like to share with us about this, because Elka Solomon was in my women's group with me. Right. And uh, she can also talk about the excitement. And I'm like, there was the other side too, but I think we should look at the really wonderful excitement of being part of a woman's group that we were all looking for a new way to um, explore who we were, what we were doing, and as artists, what that meant to us. Well, it, but in an atmosphere that was really safe for a change because it was. Right. Um, because it was private in a way, and we were there to maybe make a new language for ourselves, both um, verbally and in, and also in terms of how we looked at our work and how we thought about our work. Right. And we felt that um, we could just explore in this safe space without any interruption, because consciousness raising, one of the major facets of it, um, and it's been used as a political tool, had been used then, uh, but also as a political tool for a long time, maybe a hundred years before or so. And it'd been used to help people in different cultures uh, find themselves and feel confident in themselves. But you couldn't interrupt a person while I was speaking. <laughs> so we were, all the old form of conversation was you'd start to say something somebody would say, I know exactly what you mean. And then they'd <laughs> go off on their other thing. And then someone else would come up and say, no, that's not quite right. Or uh, as the men were doing, from what I understand, because I was married at the time, my ex-husband was a member, he said that they were very confrontational. And he, he felt that uh, it was harder for the men to have communication because that's was how men were brought up. So they kind of had that quality and um, it, it gave an opportunity to have a lots of good conversations. Nancy, um, yes, there's, yes. A, there's an, another thing that within the safety of the group, we were able to analyze a very old nugget like um, the personal is political Right. And then how we do do the how what what we do to, with the opposite of that. So you're able to somehow come up with um, a really important question that some people really um, felt one way and other people felt another way. But the, the, it was a space where you really can talk deeply about um, issues that were were in instigated by by this by this privacy and it was such a wonderful surprise to find that many of the issues we thought were personally ours and our weaknesses were really something that had a much more political context which i think is what elk is pointing out too and therefore uh, we had the opportunity to uh, do an analysis of it and examine it well, I just want to um, pr 
poised, the idea that um, nowadays um, we, we seem to have so much movement as though the engine of what you guys started, you know, uh, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, um, now Black Lives Matter, Me Too movement, um, mm -hmm. that, that the whole sort of social um, explosion of transformation um, is somehow either reignited, but somehow referencing the energy of the 60s and 70s. What do you think about that and, and about now? Well, I think that's great. I mean, I've been waiting for a long time to see people rise up and take a stand. Um, um, I'm, I'm sad that's, that some of it is as hard as it is because we did do so much work in the 70s and, eight, and 60s and 70s. And um, in some ways, it seems like we go, we've gone backwards. But it is, but backwards, you go five steps backwards, you go you know, 10 steps forward, you go back. I mean, that's just part of the normal way of- you know, There's something else, Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, and that is one of the things that we really talked about were issues of class, Right. number one. And number two is that our, when we, when we were in the same group, when, you know, the beginning of this, in the late sixties and early seventies, um, the, the second, the second, um, range of uh, women's liberation is that mm -hmm. it was a white middle class movement. Mm -hmm. um, and initially mothers were not, were not as supported as they might be. And all of that has really changed aside from um, opening up to a, a certainly much more diverse feminism. Well, not only and that, just we look. Just, say, just look at the population of the women now who are in Congress. I mean, that's so exciting to me. You couldn't be a lawyer. I mean, I mean, you could, but the women who were who are older than I and my age, who went to law school, talked about their struggles or medical school. I mean, there were quotas. It was really bad, but now that's not the case, and so it's exciting to see that happen. But Emily, did we want to look at some? I want to. Yeah, we're going to screen share right now. Thank right. you, thank you, Nancy. Let's let's um, get into some of Nancy's material work, and then we'll have another opportunity to speak together uh, okay. just after that. So, okay. uh, 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 are you guys? Well, Emily uh, Harris kind of put this together. This is my book, Spirit Taking Form, and this is. Um, and it's available through Amazon. It's easy to get. This is a sculpture I made in the early 90s. And it's called Spirit House of the Mother. And it has a magenta interior with spirals on the floor. I think we have one more photograph of this, JPEG of this. Oh no, well, maybe we'll flip through another one. But- um, So wait a minute, who, who are the ladies that we're seeing here? Do you uh, recognize them? Yes, that's Irene Peslikis. That's myself at the microphone. Carol Strunkhelis and Lucy Lassane, all members of the New York Feminist Art Institute. And active, I, I, Irene was on the board and a founder, Carol and Lucy we were all founders. And this I think might be our first open house. And the Feminist Art Institute began in 1979 and I was a way for us to explore as women what art making would be like if we had the opportunity to do that. And then this was a big a benefit we had at the Green Street Cafe auction. And the, that's some artwork. This is our first poster. So tell us about the, the Feminist Art Institute, Nancy. What, what, what was going on there? What was it that it became an actual institute, uh, maybe as an outgrowth of, of the meetings mm -hmm. that you had? And uh, there's a Judy Chicago. Right. And um, yeah, I think Louise Nevelson 
showed up and uh, Louise Bourgeois, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. We'll see some, we can see some pictures of her. We put some together. Um, so we had, and that's Faith Ringgold, I believe, teaching a workshop or part of a workshop. And we had um, a big benefit to, to start with Louise Nevelson as our guest of honor. And Louise Bourgeois came as our guest of honor later on. That was our t-shirt that just went by. And this is somebody, a participant, is talking about the work. And this is another participant. We were trying to explore whether women artists really could find within themselves so, something that was different yeah. than what we were constantly being trained to make. Because um, the bulk of, of art students were women and the uh, practically all of the men instructors were all of the men were, were instructors. So we were uh, shaped in those kinds of um, university and art school situations to make work the way men's vision was of, of, of art. And many women stopped making art because it no longer became exciting to them or something that they wanted to participate in. So uh, this was a way to reestablish that, to find within yourself what it is that you really wanted to make. Nancy, do you mind me asking, um, and if I'm, you know, it, 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 I don't mean to be ir irreverent, but I think it's interesting to understand. You're all individual artists working in your studios, right. perhaps independently, but was there actual collaboration? Was there competition? Was there, what was the sort of, you know, dynamic in the, um, in, in the community? And I'm sure it maybe changed uh, now and again, but can you describe a little bit about what the feeling was between the, the members and the friendships and the camaraderie or, uh, as I mentioned, you know, competition? I mean, we're all individual parts of, 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 a, of a big whole. Mm -hmm. And how was it that this was respected um, in, in that, in that context at that time? Well, it was a long haul. It was it took a lot of work, a lot of understanding, a lot of compassion for each other, and a lot of appreciation of the differences that we had. And as Elka pointed out, for instance, um, we had to expand, we had a too narrow a vision, but we had so much to work with that it was hard to, um, we had so much within ourselves that needed to be healed. So it was hard to expand at the beginning. And you know, if you look at our, within ourselves, unless we heal ourselves of things that, that prevent us from moving forward, it's really hard to move forward. And it's really hard to, um, if not almost impossible, to appreciate the other in a way that deserves to be appreciated. So we were all exploring these things. It was brand new. I mean, we didn't have any history. We didn't go right. what we knew about. We didn't go uh, to school and learn about women's history. I remember having one paragraph about um, the, um, um, the different women who worked with the poor and, um, and a little bit about women's suffrage, maybe a couple sentences. I didn't know that women chained themselves to the gates of the White House. My daughter was shocked too to see that they force fed them. I mean, they were brutal to these women just because they were women and they wanted to vote. They had the nerve in quotes to think that they were equal to men. And, um, <clears throat> and prohibition was around the same time. Gee. So lots of things got caught up, but um, to lose sight of the fact uh, that we were working towards understanding who we were, why we were so oppressed, and many women, it was so exciting to see this other part, uh, went to all kinds of thrift shops and bookstores and found wonderful books that women had written that nobody was interested in buying or promoting. 
So that came out too. And so we spent a lot of time reading. They spent, I got so tired of, of, um, of reading all these articles about the women's movement. After a while, I just had a little bit of overkill. And so um, I remember feeling that I just can't read anymore about this for a while. And I didn't, but I participated and I was part of the whole movement. And there I am in my late 20s, I think maybe early <laughs> 30s. And there's the piece I'm carving. I'm a wood carver. Um, I think this piece was called Sicilian Flowers. This yeah. piece is called William, Widow's Tongues. What, what, what year are we looking at that? What, when is that made? 1972, maybe. 71, 72. So and, at a certain time there, Nancy, there was a sort of um, a big movement toward in, introspection and a focus on intuition and, uh, you know, imagination and the value of uh, visions and such. Mm -hmm. um, you, you led a workshop that seemed to become a teaching method. Yeah. Uh, what was the atmosphere like in terms of, you know, that, that moment in time? And I think uh, even Michael Katz, uh, you, you both shared a certain time of um, mutual study in mm -hmm. Tibetan Buddhism, if you don't mind me saying. Um, I started with Michael. Michael yeah. was my teacher, mm -hmm. I would say. I don't know if Michael would group that that way, but that's how I see it. So this was going on, yeah? Well, it was an exciting moment in the world. I mean, we were trying to change the way the world uh, looked at us. I mean, I remember these women who bought <clears throat> stocks in the New York Times so that they could go to stock meetings and demand that they uh, could you that we could use they could would use the word miss instead of miss or missus I mean if you weren't married you were a miss until you were like 80 <laughs> you were a girl until you were 80 people didn't use the word woman if you were old they would call you a woman but when you were young, um, you were always a girl until you were old and then you became a woman. If you leave, reach that age, but you were a girl and that's how it was. And there were dress codes about um, what to wear. There were want ads, there were women's want ads and men's want ads. And there was the term Girl Friday which was a very popular term, which meant that you were the jack of all trades in an office. And you, the um, financial uh, situation for women and men were very different. I mean, it was. Well, Nancy, what, what is encouraging to you about what you see today in, in the women's movement and evolution into rightfully into some, uh, level playing field with, with men? How do you respond to the, the things that you see? And what do you see? Well, I see the excitement to see all the newscasters. Like there's, there were three or four women newscasters who were dealing on MSNBC with the, um, uh, the January 6th event and the trial. And right. there was one man. Uh, if you go back 30 years, you'd never see a woman or maybe one woman would be part of the newscaster. So that's exciting to me. And now you don't only see white faces, you see people of color in, in major positions. And that's very exciting to me. It's very exciting to me to see how the world opened up and it has to continue to open up because it just, it will. I mean, it's, that's, it's this historic fact. It has to open up. So in fact, um, there are many edges of, of society where the movement is just beginning to really flourish in different parts of the world. It mm -hmm. wasn't that long ago, and maybe it still exists in India, that a woman would be stoned to death uh, after her husband died, right. or if she committed adultery, Mm -hmm. um, 
women, I think, is it in Saudi Arabia were prevented from driving cars, I, mm -hmm. I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So still, mm -hmm. um, things are not quite up to speed in many parts of the world. This is true. This is true. Do you have um, any kind of advice to people in this, in these, you know, how do you see that sort of, I guess it's different in every culture, but um, is it inevitable? And isn't it inevitable that there has to be a social evolution? No, it is inevitable and it's happening. And it doesn't, things like this don't happen easily because people don't like to give up their privilege. Right. That's it. I mean, that's really, I think all we can say about it. Uh, and we can watch it happen and we can see these women taking over positions in Congress. I mean, uh, Nancy Pelosi, I mean, she's just, I mean, so great to see a woman like her who is so gifted running um, Congress, you know, being in charge. So these are great things. I mean, um, when, when you were a kid, Nancy, yeah. your, your family, were they second generation or first generation Italian Americans? My, fam my parents were born here. My grandparents okay. were born in Italy, Sicily. Right. I had one grandparent who was born near Naples. Yeah. They were all from Southern Italy and, um, and other, three of them identified as Sicilian. And the one grandmother that was born um, near Naples was not treated nicely by her, her in-laws because they didn't like that. They wanted the marriages to be from close, like also from Sicily or towns that were close by. So do you, do you feel that like in your grandparents' um, generation that uh, entering into the um, you know, American capitalist space mm -hmm. was uh, pretty hard going and that um, not that dissimilar from other minorities that, that have been prejudiced against, uh, that society would be all the richer if uh, the underprivileged, so-called underprivileged and victimized actually could teach us uh, things about society that uh, we, we can't benefit from as long as they're, um, you know, in a, in a diminished and weak state. You, you know, it's like uh, my family were, um, so uh, like you, mm -hmm. my great grandparents were immigrants uh -huh. to America. Mm -hmm. And um, I was the first person in my family to even consider with some um, degree of uh, force to be an artist. Mm -hmm. How was it looked upon in your family um, was it was it hard transition to occupy your sort of position that you are an artist? Did you know when you were a kid that you were going to make visual art? And do you feel in some way, you know, some entry into um, community leadership that, that you ultimately that you ultimately occupied? No, I mean I wasn't brought up to be. Um anything other than a companion to my mother, to live close by, to look after her, a very traditional background. And my mother was very upset that I was an artist. She thought that I could have really done a lot with my life, like I could have been a receptionist or a model. That's how it went. And um, so I was a very rebellious child. But I'm thinking that we should, if you if people want to see sculpture, we might just go through a little bit of it because. Let, yeah, we're just, just about to go back into that stream of work. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you, John. So this is widow's tongues. And this comes from a plant that's called widow's tongues. And it struck me during all the work I was doing with the women's movement, how um, plants were given names, derogatory names about women. 
I mean, what must it been like? I mean, not to speak of the Indian culture where they literally burnt the widows to death on the pyre with the men or, uh, and you know, they, they could, had no life left. Um, um, here, a woman who was a widow probably had no one to really um, look after, to be with, to be friends with. I mean, she was lucky if she had grandchildren, then she could probably have status and also spend time with them. So the idea of say, calling a plant a widow's tongue, which is, it's also called the snake plant. It has circuitous, it's green, usually has a little yellow in it. And it's very circuitous in terms of how the leaves move upward. And it's very hardy though, I liked that part of it. So that's what this piece was called. Maybe we could go to the next one. Yeah, this is a close up. This is called the spirit house, no, sorry. This is called Heart Wall, and it's 22 feet long, and it's a car, all carved wood. Some of the wood is very old wood, and some of the wood is new wood. Some of it are some of it is branches in the center. This, the red, uh, the two red branches that intertwine with each other, are um, from a tree that was felled close by. Is this piece called Heart Wall? Heart Wall, yes. And it's really about the heart chakra and the um, heart sutra, which is the Buddhist, beautiful Buddhist heart sutra. But I felt that I didn't want people to feel removed from it if I used the, the Buddhist term. So that was then. I think now people are more open to terms that they don't understand as much or see as much. So this was called Heart Wall, but it's really about the Heart Sutra, which is a beautiful prayer. And, it, and it, parts of it uh, bring back the sound of the heartbeat within us. So uh, it's 22 but, feet long. Nancy, you, when you talk about healing, you know, yeah. uh, healing energy and healing. Right. Um, your work also seems to in, in, evoke a sense of uh, well-being or, mm -hmm. you know, um, You've talked about your work also celebrating the goddess. Um, and maybe you could just tell us a little bit about the, the healing aspect uh, of, of how you work. Well, we found a perfect piece to do it. This is Hand Garden Doctor's Wall. It's at the Robert Wood Johnson Hospital in Hamilton, New Jersey. It's a commission. It's 25 feet total. So that to the left you'll see is the other part of the side wall. And um, the reason why the two bars are there is so that if people drive a cart into the wall, they hit the bars instead. And, and it's of the doc head doctor's hands at the hospital. Now there were no women head doctors at that time. I imagine it's changed now. Uh, at the time I was told it was beginning to change, but um, we, I, we traced my partner who's a doctor and I went and um, she traced the, hand, the doctor's hands. And I was told I couldn't say whose, whose hands were where because the doctors would fight about them. So I didn't. And then at the opening, they did have little fights about whose hands were where, but I snuck in some women's hands and there's my hand in there too. Um, Nancy, and, the, yeah. the work also, obviously, um, emotes um, a, a lot of feeling through through light, right. through the use of, of light. And I wonder um, if you use these kinds of tools as a way of shocking us or arresting our attention in a non-conceptual way so we can enter into this other sensorial, you know, tactile healing energies. The work actually is sort of a a tool for healing in, in these ways. Yes, this is true. Uh, well, uh, possibly. I mean, gold leaf is really like sunlight and it's like ra about radiance. It's about the energy all around us. And we do emanate a kind of energy. Um, if you study or look at the idea of the chakra energy, there's radiate, we radiate things that come from within us. 
And so in other words, these 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 are can also be like evocative tools for the for energy uh, movement in the body and purification. Yes, yes. This is called Maxie's Wall, and it's in honor of the um, birth and uh, and um, development of my granddaughter. I think she was maybe about seven or eight at the time. There's her little hands there, which you can see. And it's old wood. Um, some of the wood came from the lock buildings in Tribeca where I live and, um, and were very hard to carve. And some of them, not because they're, or they, the wood was so hard, because a lot of them is Douglas fir. And since the wood is so old, it was much more intense in terms of how it, was, how it grew, I guess. But the other part of it was that there were nails in it and it had been battered because it had been ripped out of beams. And, um, and I, was re -car I was carving, I was re, I mean, that's the other part. It was sort of giving life to these really old battered things. Nancy, what, was there a message that you wanted to convey to your granddaughter by making this kind of thing? It's like a celebration of her life. And also, um, as you can see, there's all these other parts to life that have a little bit of um, struggle. And I mean, she's too young, she's 16 now. So maybe someday we can have a more of a mature conversation about it. And she's a pretty grown up 16 year old, but uh, we'll see as, as time goes on. Did, did childbearing um, sort of change the way you saw your role and your also social role as um, being you know, part of the, the great creation of the universe? Oh, sure. I mean, it's a great mystery. All of the, I mean, there's so much in life that where where we can look at these great mysteries and feel um, connected to them in different ways. Uh, this is a goddess piece. You almost feel in this piece the way you felt in the way I feel about having made the spirit house of the mother. There's like an energy inside of it, so that the top it's ten feet high, and the top part projects out. So you feel almost like a presence inside of it as you look at this piece. And um, this is dawn light. So if we could just go back a second. Um, who do you feel were your sort of mentors or inspirations was Louise Nevelson looked quite advanced in age uh, in the photograph that we'd seen of her just there. She was. Uh -huh. I remember she lived down the block from me in Little Italy, and that was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. I don't think she lived all that much longer, but how did you all sort of um, relate? I mean, did you feel that she was an inspiration for you? Oh, definitely. Uh, she was an inspiration for many women. That's why we had her as the guest of honor at our opening benefit. And that benefit was at the World Trade Center and she had just um, dedicated a huge piece that she had made. And she said it was one of the major pieces of her life, um, Neville, uh, Louise Neville said. And so there she is. Yeah. So this is at the World Trade Center. This is at the World Trade Center. There's Gloria Steinem behind her. Yeah. Karen Lippert, who also worked at Ms. Magazine and was their publicity person. And a woman called Mitch Costanza, who was part of, of Jimmy Carter's administration. So that was uh, in 1979. And yeah. uh, but Louise Nevelson was a diva. So it's not, I mean, although I knew people who had been friendly with her, um, she was not at that point in her life approachable. So I never became friendly with her. Louise Bourgeois was a little different. And, um, and then also Lenore Tawney, who was a mentor to me. That's Louise. Uh, she was a little different. She actually 
Well, she was younger than Louise Nevelson, but she she's older there. She's probably in her 70s there. She actually would go to women's meetings and of uh, young women's meetings and just participate in some way. Sometimes she'd hold court and have a little sub meeting on the side. Um, but she was a very young, active woman. What's it's happening here. behind Louise Bourgeois? Uh, it says something about the Ford Foundation. I guess that's some- The Ford Foundation gave us grant for a year in 1981, I think it was. So we opened in 79 and we really struggled to stay open because we were trying to explore what art was about and what women's art was about and where um, inside of ourselves we could make art uh, that was not told, didn't work or didn't have this color or didn't have a composition that was appropriate or whatever. We were just making work to make work. And the Ford Foundation gave us money for to, to set up programs and continue. And we had a big program uh, where Louise joined, as you can see, she was really part of the group. Uh, she was someone who was extremely accessible to people. And we were so pleased that we had money from the Ford Foundation at that time. So this is 1981, I think. I have to double check my dates because it's been quite a few years, but I think around that time. Well, it's just somehow very impressive to see her there. Really it is. Yeah, well, she was great. And she was, the night before she decided she wasn't coming because she was too busy working in her studio. So I had to talk her into coming, which was not easy, but she came and uh, we had to pick her up. So Darla, who was part of the um, New York Feminist Art Institute, um, went and picked her up and her, she had a car, she went and picked her up and she saw Louise's complete studio, which was such a treat. So wow. that wow. was great. And Louise toured her, uh, showed her the whole thing. And she came wearing a trench coat. And so I always thought, well, maybe Louise was making art that day and didn't want to be bothered. I mean, that's often what happens. So anyway. That, yeah, and that's, that's, that's a good thing for all of us, right? Right. Now this is the collage that's from the Crow and Sandal series. The sandal of the guru is a sacred thing. And often you'll see them on the altar of different Hindu um, spiritual altars. And so I was, uh, I had, there was some kind of a medical problem that I had and um, I was in the hospital and out of, out of that, came 13 of these pieces. I didn't want to stop at 13 really, but I made myself stop at 13 because 13 is a witchy sacred number and I wanted to have that as part of uh, the experience. So uh, I think we have a few more. There's your crow and there's the sandal. A crow is a harbinger of uh, different messages uh, in many cultures. And uh, this is a piece that um, is a branch uh, from um, a big, 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 someone gave this to me. Now I'm trying to remember its source, but it was, it's quite huge. And it has this quality, almost like a cobweb or a brain. And it was put into an exhibition which discussed different machinations of the mind uh, it's fragile, and um, I've started to work more with white. Now I'm pretty much working with using the color white, silver, some gold, maybe another color here and there, but in the sculpture now it's become white. The background piece here is a, is a shadow. Nancy, it, it, when I read your, you know, your biography online, uh, yeah. and I use some of that in our flyer for you, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it references that you work with large scale wooden sculptures right. and mixed media installations and exploring life cycles 
utilizing the tree as a metaphor for right. personhood, right. exploring folkloric stories of mystic women's roles, goddess imagery, ancient symbols, and affirmation of female self. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as we look at that image here and, and previous images, we see quite directly, uh, you know, the tree itself, not an abstracted tree, but um, sort of a tree somewhere between um, the ephemeral and the material, perhaps. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's abstracted in the sense that I worked with it. I cut off branches. I trimmed it in a certain way. I painted it white, gessoed it white. And then I also focused on the shadow. So I'm, I'm expecting next July uh, that I will be showing some of these pieces. This and is recent work. This is recent work, yeah. And I'll be showing some of these pieces at the AIR gallery in Dumbo. Oh, great. I think there are at least two other uh, AIR artists here on the show with us tonight, yeah? Yes, I think so. Liz Biddle. That's right. Yeah, Elka. Elka, well, and yeah. I'm not sure who else, but it's, it's great. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that's how you and Emily Harris, I think, have, have, have met at the AIR gallery. Right? We did, we did, years ago. Emily and I met. I don't remember how many years, but it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, all right. I don't know if Jason's still here, but Jason, you helped me with that base. I don't know if you remember, you're still here, probably. So these, these works are up in Woodstock now, is that right? The large works? The large works are in Woodstock, yeah. They're too, too big to work. Oh, Jason said yes, he remembers. Oh, good. Huh. Came out kind of sparkling, Jason. He put a lot of really nice energy in it for me. So, Nancy... Yeah, there we are. So uh, this work might be in AIR, you're saying, in, in the next... Uh... This this piece will be in AIR in, in um, July. And um, the, the, the little piece that's on the side, the little tree, I think I'm going to move it apart from it. Um, so as we talked about the guru's sandals, also the guru's feet, and there's the feet, the spiritual feet from here, and then there's the spiritual feet from the other world. Um, and it's a steel chair, it's a high chair. And anyway, you can see it, and it's white, and it has gold leaf at the bottom, and gold leaf, carved gold leaf as the seat. So, so okay. There is another one. That's that's uh, about seven or eight feet high. It's about seven. Well, I think total, yeah, seven or eight feet high. And um, it is made with encaustic. It's like a blue cloud. It's got a indigo blue, which is the color of the third eye. So it's intuition, psychic sight, and then it has a, a touch of encaustic. Uh, over it, uh, which is like a white encaustic. So it has this wonderful kind of cloud-like quality. Arch. This is also on a steel base. How large is that now, Nancy? Not too big. About Two and a half feet. Uh -huh. Okay. Painted well, I've been, with white I, I was honored to uh, have an interview session with you back in October. And so you saw the week of work in person. Yeah, and I'm um, excited to get to edit that film soon. Oh. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about your? Yeah, there it is. This this, this work, spirit taking form, and tell us what that is. Well, on the cover of Spirit Taking Form. And then there's a quote there from Gloria Steinem. Right, yes. Which I can't read from here, but maybe you can. I'll read it out loud to you. Good, okay, good. Tell us how to meditate our way. 
into our imaginations and give our thoughts and feelings visible form. Yeah. Tells us how to meditate our way into our imagination and give our thoughts and feelings visible form. That's yeah. Gloria Steinem's quote uh, on your book. Yes, uh, well, and Louise Bourgeois actually did a quote too. Um, I think, I don't know if it's at the frontispiece or the, in the back, but um, basically from teaching at the New York Feminist Art Institute, a class in consciousness raising where we drew and made art as we talked, I uh, developed a, uh, I began to think this is really excellent. We're, we're making so much headway in terms of what we see within ourselves. And people would be, women would begin to feel that they were learning then what their original forms were. And I myself began to see that too. So I thought, well, maybe we should try meditation because meditation might bring us deeper into that place. Uh, to explore who we are and to bring those original forms out. So, so I tried using meditation and making art from meditation. And I started to develop these workshops and taught in a lot of different places, including in Europe. And I found um, the excitement that we were looking for began to develop from making art about the self in a way that was so true. It was really who we were and it was really about who we are about. So I began to make those um, meditations which are in the back of the book actually. So the first half of the book talks about my journey as an artist and what I felt about in my life and uh, why I became an artist which was because I wanted to explore that deeper part of myself. And then the second part of the book has the meditations, which I used in various places and where people would then discover what their art was about and how they wanted to work with uh, the things they were seeing by going deep into their personal self. And so we would discuss that. And I would tell them, you know, this is not art to go into the museum. This is not something you're making to go into the Whitney. You're just making it as if you would make a diary, but it's a visual one. And so wonderful things happened. And uh, they made work that's very inspiring and exciting to me too. Um, because I always tried to, I would always count the number of people in the class and I'd always be looking for the extra person. I couldn't find them. One day I realized it was me. I was counting myself as a member of the class, which I was really, if you think about it. And I couldn't figure out. So that's what happened. So then I stopped counting myself as a member so consciously because I was always thinking, well, we have to wait for one more person or where's that other person? And there I was sitting there not knowing. So that's how that yeah. came together. Um. You know, uh, there seems to be some perhaps misunderstanding for some people about what meditation uh, is like and what it sort of um, leads to in one's life. And, mm -hmm. you know, it may seem to some people that it's a very self-absorbed and self-involved, um, subjective kind of uh, indulgent process mm -hmm. where in, in, in effect, it actually is a bridge into mm -hmm. the world, a bridge into the big world through investigating the inner world. So yeah. you were preparing people to be more powerful in their work in the world. Uh, yes. yes. And people used to choose my class at uh, when I taught in Duluth, Minnesota. I taught the other week workshops. They used to just figure out, oh, they have that time on vacation. They would point their finger at my class because it would come that week and they take it and then they complain to me. I mean, they enjoyed the class, but I would get a lot of complaints about uh, 
I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. I didn't expect to do this or that, but it was so rewarding and so interesting that it was worth every minute of it. And they agreed with that too, of course. Well, so it was kind of- Nancy, we, we've come through a whistle stop tour of your work. Right. And now we're at the point where it'd be interesting to open the door up okay. um, for other people to engage with you besides myself. And I'm sure uh, there are a lot of people with, you know, a lot of powerful minds and talent here. So um, please, anyone who uh, would like to make a comment or ask a question or just have a chat with Nancy. Um, Gordon is here and I alluded, Gordon, to a question I had uh, also for you last week, which was, you know, can the uh, under, um, undereducated, um, under, Privileged in social social rights and 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 access and power, can this aspect of society, like any immigrant uh, or minorities in society, like like the women's movement, for example, and civil rights movement, is, is isn't the grassroots actually the place where new life, new society, and new visions for society have to arise from? Um, anyway, it just was my question earlier, Nancy, and I'm uh, vocalizing that toward Gordon. Um, so maybe you guys take your time with that, but uh, let's have a few other voices now, uh, unless Gordon wants to make a comment about that, his response to Nancy's work. Well, there's a lot there. I'm trying to get clarity if you're asking me to respond to the question you just posed or to you know, the extraordinary work that Nancy has been so gracious to share with us, and not quite. Well, sure. you know, I noticed Gordon that there's been um, quite a lot of reference to the church in in the black society uh, as being the place where people of great intelligence and prominence had to emerge through the church to enter into the larger society, and in a sense, Nancy's group and the feminist movement also has this kind of sense of, you know, a, a gathering and um, attunement to, uh, to the causes and developing stratagem for changing society. So we can always come back to that, but that was basically uh, my, my, um, my impulse when, when Nancy and I were speaking earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I mean, I'll, res I'll respond to uh, the first part of your question and then try to incorporate it into uh, what you just asked now uh, with respect to you know, individuals of color and women. You know, I think that once we start appreciating that, by example, women you know, uh, constitute more than 50% of our overall population. And once we recognize that individuals of color you know, certainly in New York City, uh, the state of California, uh, and soon to be, you know, in this country, uh, I, I am reluctant, I'm resident about, res I'm resistant to actually use the term minority majority, but that people of color do constitute the majority in New York City, in California, and within the next 25 years will constitute the majority in this country. So we really shouldn't be one, using the term minority, uh, and two, you know, the importance of recognizing what that power, you know, can constitute, you know, in its appropriate sense. Uh, the Black church should not be looked at as being uh, sacrosanct in, in its uh, ability to convey a collective thought or will of, of uh, Black people, um, you know, if only illustrated over the last four years, where there have been a number of Black clergy that have actually been, you know, much to, much to our chagrin, in support of Donald Trump, in support of the GOP. And so that's actually been not only in opposition to, but it's, uh, uh, it's contradictory of where the majority of the populace was actually not looking at that individual, nor is the 
the party as being uh, something that was was able to benefit you know these communities of color. So you know, so I'll, I'll posit that there. Um, and I, I apologize because I kind of got a little lost on the, the second part of your question, but uh, I'll defer to Nancy. And then if you re-ask it or want me to respond to it, I'll gladly do so. Thanks, Gordon. Well, if I remember, Cole, your question was really about grassroots, which means the people. It really means um, just a person, you know, the groups of people. And of course it has to come from within, it has to come from the heart. And that kind of change uh, is coming. I mean, uh, Gordon is absolutely right. The population uh, has will be changing radically in the next 20 years, I mean, 30 years. And I think that's why we have so much uh, resistance because people know that. And I have a lot of hope that this new, uh, that our new president will be up to uh, act, making change happen in a po very positive way. So we'll see. Great to see everyone here. And uh, you know, one, one feels the, the presence of so much concentration and, and uh, engagement. Mm -hmm. And in that of, of itself is, is so uh, nurturing and, and, and empowering for us. Um, so thank you all for being a, such a committed uh, community and um, for the you know, energy that we're maybe to, together bringing into the world, hopefully fearlessly moving on together, not just as individuals, but as as collective somehow. That's our vision for the Tuning Fork and the Institute for Cultural Activism. Uh, Emily and I are really, really happy. Um, Nancy's with us and Na actually Emily has a question also you wanted to ask just. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, well, actually I had a question, but I think, um, and it looks like Jason has a question. I feel like you answered my question about um, how you were trying to draw out in a safe space, this visual vocabulary um, of women that was, uh, unique. Anyway, I think you answered my question, just that you did. Um, so, Jason. <laughs> well, if you don't yeah, mind, Jason. Emily, maybe I can ask you a question, Emily, and what's it like to be sort of in the, sort main, of in the main dream, dream of, of, of uh, Nancy's studio and her work uh, over so many years? What, what was it like for you as Nancy, a kind of mentor to you? And maybe you can say something about that. Um, well, we've been working together since, we've been working together since 2007. Really? And it is such a privilege oh. and an honor to just, um, be part of helping you to make this work, but also to watch you, um, uh, because I'm never really involved in the art making. That, that's not really, maybe I did some gilding, but um, to watch these forms that you make, it's um, just really privilege. Classes. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Emily. And I know that you both are, are involved with some ongoing uh, conversations and collectives, for example, the group that you uh, we're involved with from Australia, Nancy and Emily. Yeah. Well, Tell we, us about that, Nancy, can you? Well, we were, we were trying to um, bring together, Emily and I, uh, we kind of discussed this idea and then we tried to bring together 
younger women artists and older women artists because a lot of older women artists were in very embittered because younger women artists were getting so much more, so much attention and did have, they would complain. These women have galleries, they have attention, uh, they get grants and we don't get anything. So I thought, well, it would be wonderful to bring together these women. Um, I was gonna say myself included, which means I have to count me again, <laughs> <laughs> not forget that number. Um, and so we would meet when we could. Uh, we met maybe uh, four times a year or something like that. And uh, it was pretty exciting. And sometimes there'd be more older women at the meetings and sometimes there'd be more younger women at the meetings. And we, um, we had two places we met, two galleries. One was uh, in New York City and one was in Dumbo. And we, we noticed that the population would change depending upon where the gallery was and where the meeting was. So um, that's what we did. And we had long discussions uh, about this issue, about um, women, younger women, what they, they felt like in terms of their, what they had as privilege and older women and their struggle now to be even seen. So anyway, so that was it. I think, did Jason have a, a, a question too? Jason, are you still there? You are. Jason. Sure, Nancy, um, thanks, for, thanks for your talk. Um, you've been actually, you've been a very respectful and strong ally of the Native American community in New York City. Uh, I'm curious to know how, and we've had talks about how you integrate some of that culture and those beliefs and um, uh, values into your artwork. Uh, I've heard you talk about how you've supported women's rights um, and those politics, but I'm curious about your influences and how you continue to, you, to be influenced by indigenous perspectives while remaining respectful in your um, production. Well, you know, Jason, it was not hard because I, well, first of all, when I started, I didn't want to make sculpture that was just about men on horses, you know, looking like they were exceptional, which I never were related to at all, or some of the other sculptures like uh, naked women, uh, the, uh, women um, who were really not being celebrated because they had done something important for themselves, but, but the nature of being sex objects that were say around the Manhattan Bridge. They were, I think they're at the Brooklyn Museum now. So all of these things um, uh, didn't really appeal to me, but sculpture, something about sculpture drew me so that I just, uh, I sort of went to the sculpture studio at the Art Students League and never, really never returned. I just fell in love. And um, Native American culture and Native American work all drew, opened my heart. I mean, it's just so amazing as an artist to really see uh, the kind of work people did and, um, and how much they related to who I am and to the world now. I mean, there's so much relevance there. And also the other thing, I think the third part about all of this is that I never wanted to be a sculptor just to make money and to be famous. I mean, I like to have recognition, but I really wanted to make my art out of a spiritual place. And so I studied all these different things. I studied a lot of Northwest Coast art. I studied, studied the Plains art. I just studied as everything I could. I went and I did a pilgrimage once in, in New York State. I went to all the different Iroquois Federation places that I could manage in the time I had. And we just drove there and we drove to the museums and we talked to people and, and people were so kind. They would bring out um, masks, those false face masks that the Iroquois people make. They'd bring them out and show me and it was so exciting and wonderful. And there's a quality that uh, contemporary art made by my peers 
often doesn't have. Um, and so I couldn't have too many conversations about with them. But with Native people and their artwork or with people who are making work from a spiritual place, it just opened my heart. So that's why. <laughs> it's hard to talk about things that don't have, that words really only can dance around, but that's sort of how it is. Nancy, I believe that Gordon wanted to ask a question. Oh. And uh, I, I, let's give Gordon the floor for, for now. And maybe there are other, other folks too. Okay. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, Nancy, what I wanted to ask is, you know, first by setting it up that your work has always, from, it appears to me, has always had a conversation with the future. Uh, and I wonder, you know, one, what's behind your eyes? What is, you know, where are you trying to push your art or the medium or what are the things that you are attempting to say that may not have been said or that you feel are necessary to be said in your, you know, by using your work? Well, uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question as directly as I would like, but I want uh, women's work to be seen for what it is, uh, for what it's saying. And often that doesn't happen uh, because we are so trained to see art in a certain way, to see the world in a certain way. I think maybe we can start with that. You know, we're so trained to see the world in a certain way that to open our minds and our hearts to see it in a different way is scary for us all of us, you know? I mean, I try to have a lot of courage about things like this, but, you know, it's, it's tricky and hard, as you know. Um, I was, uh, there's a, a Southern Italian proverb that I was just reading the other day that it was so exciting. It was these Calabrian women singing uh, that when they see the devil, they don't run. And I loved that. I just thought, wow. That's interesting. I mean, they're tough ladies. I mean, I've met these women different times and um, all of those uh, women uh, have this strength and quality to them that I always am in awe of and a bit, uh, a bit. So, um, so it didn't surprise me that that uh, proverb was something that came, or song came out of something they were thinking. So I, I've been, I wrote it down and I'm going to think some more about it. Imagine, I mean, this is a place where people really think of the devil as a, 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 a human surrogate, another force. <laughs> Seeing, imagine yourself being from a culture like that and, and then confronting that as it comes at you, either from within yourself or outside, wherever you think it is. Uh, I don't have to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 I try to imagine them. Right, no, understood. Walking down the street, these women, as they do in this rocky terrain. You know, anyway, so uh, I can well, let me that. Let me give you a proverb that uh, I've been holding. Oh, yes, please. Mediocrity is commonplace. And when excellence presents itself, we don't recognize it. That's true. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. We have, a lot to go. we have a lot to leave with, I must say. A lot to think about after this. Thank you all for sharing this with me too. Margaret? Please, um, let's, um, everybody, can we remove everyone's microphone? Can you, can you hear us? All at once? Yes, Nelly. Yes. yes. Because Nelly. Robert, Robert wants to say something. I okay, want to ask, I, I want to ask, ask a question. question. So yes. sculptors, sculptors work in stone. They work in metal. They work in many, many, all sorts of, they work in feathers. They work, your work as I know it sort of, for me, centers on wood. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little, is that true and how that happened, how you arrived there? 
Well, I just always loved trees. I remember as a child watching the trees and the shadows of trees and watching the reverence uh, my grandfather had for trees. And it was all in uh, Sicilian because they would talk to each other. And of course, I, they wouldn't teach me because they, uh, that was not, uh, they didn't, they, it was dangerous, they felt. You know, I, I've decided it was, they thought it was dangerous. That's my latest theory about it, but they wouldn't teach me. And so it was so melodic in some way. And so it sounds like Arab music in other ways. And, <clears throat> and so I fell in love with the plants that he loved, the fig tree. Um, he had several fig trees. He also had several mulberry trees, which as I later found out, uh, Sicily had a lot of silk. Silk was a, a major product of Sicily for many centuries. And so the mulberry tree would be something that they would be familiar with and want in their life. So all of those things were a part of that. And um, I think that as I grew up and knew that you could carve trees and I loved finding the life in a tree, especially if it's a tree that someone's discarded, um, brutalized, whatever. I just would carve into it and it would be, you can take a, the ugliest looking piece of wood that you find on the street that's thrown away and carve into it and it opens up to this magnificent thing. And so there was that quality uh, that I loved. And so, and if you carve a cherry tree, the fragrance of the cherries are so wonderful. So I would um, carve pear trees and cherry trees and just be totally enthralled with how the tree was inside when you carved into it. And then I would feel like I was having a dialogue with the tree. The tree and I would have this conversation. And so that's what, uh, that's what came up then. So I think that answers. Yeah, beautiful, thank you. You're welcome. That answers your question. Oh, have a bounce everybody. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, I just stand back and look at everyone's uh, images here and hope that as the tuning fork becomes less, um, how can I put it? Uh, as we get to meet each other more, more often and in person, that we don't forget about this community um, and that we also don't forget about the lessons that we're, we're learning mm -hmm. uh, during this pandemonium and um, opportunity to uh, reinvent our society. Mm -hmm. Hopefully through cultural activism, we all can make a contribution, of course, individually and, and together. Uh, so unless anyone else has a comment, then we can say good night. And um, we're excited to see Lisa Bresnak, and Elka and Nils Hill and you know, all our dear friends that we don't get to see too often right now. So thanks, Nancy, for invigorating us further and nurturing uh, the Institute for Cultural Activism in the great ways that you are and do. Um, something else, Em? There's a hand there. For Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Are you waving goodbye or saying hello? hello. Can you hear me? Goodbye, hello. Sounds like a song. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank I just you. want to say, Nancy, this has been very much more inspirational than I thought. I just, I just came to get to know you a little bit more. And um, having been an artist who's been on a hiatus for over 20 years, yeah. um, I just want to say that I'm inspired in a way that I really didn't expect. Um, so yeah. thank you. Um, I loved working with wood when I was about 14 and 15 years old and have thought about it my whole life. Um, 
And I think I'm going to start using my hands more. So thank wood. you. That's all. The wood is calling you. Yeah, the wood is the <laughs> the, the colors, the art, just art itself. Yeah. So thank you. Very, your life is very interesting. <laughs> I don't know how to deal with this. <laughs> we need, we need <laughs> the best technology. <laughs> but it was at the end because I just would have been totally uh, bewildered as to how to deal with it. But it, it hung up. I think. Nancy, I'd like to say hello to you. I haven't seen you for a very long time. Can you hear me? There's Michael Katz. Uh, uh, oh, Nancy. Michael, is that you? Oh, good. Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to say hello, and I'm very happy to see you. I haven't connected with you in a long time, partly because of the COVID. But, um, you know, it's great to see you and hear more about the substrata of your art. So, um, thank you, Michael. You know, we share a lot of interests, and, uh, you know, I, I hold you in great esteem. So, thank you, Michael. It's lovely to to connect with you and to see you in a red shirt, which is, I think I've never seen you in one before. <laughs> Someone called this shade of red claret. I don't know if that's true. I don't know either, but it sure is about the root chakra, isn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you so much, John so, and Emily for inviting me. It was oh, really thank you, fun. Nancy. And it was lovely to see everybody and see some people I don't know. and and to become acquainted with them and some old friends. So thank you. Um, friends who, who, uh, whose email addresses we don't have, please email me directly. It's very simple. John at mdsfilms.com. MDS films, John at mdsfilms.com. And uh, we're now just going to um, say goodnight with our, one of our, um, Go to songs. So here we go. Nancy, maybe you'd like to join us. Oh, well, of course, if I, of course, I'll try. Happy I'm not to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. <laughs> Dining on till then. <laughs> <laughs> See you next week, folks. Be well, be safe. Thank you. The Tuning Fork, setting the tone for cultural activism through weekly encounters with cultural activists worldwide, live on ICAI, Institute for Cultural Activism International. <laughs>